Welcome to the Wise Old Owl podcast. I'm excited about this show because if you're an aspiring influencer and you want to know how I got into the social media game, this is a can't miss episode with my son, Mark Gaetano, also known as Snarky Marky. Thanks for taking the time out of your busy school schedule to join me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. So for everybody who is uh, listening, I have I can't be where I am without you because you are the one that's inspired me to get into social, told me to stop doing TV, <laughs> get into social and help people buy homes, especially your age group. And I said, well, Mark, why would anybody want to listen to me? And you said, because you have knowledge that we don't have and don't talk to us like a dad. So right. thanks for that. And tell me what has gotten you where you are, because it's been a long road. What should people out there who want to get into the social media game, influencer game, know about this space? What's involved? What's the journey like? So I've been doing this for over four years. I started in my senior year. I was in 12th grade in September 2019, and I just kept on posting and posting and then kind of led me to where I am here, where I'm kind of able to do it on a full-time basis. Um, it's been a wonderful journey. There's been a couple of bumps in the road, but nonetheless, um, it's been great and just something I would have never even dreamed of. Um, and I'm so grateful for all the opportunities that it has provided me. Um, but I think my one piece of advice that I'd offer the most is just being authentic. I think that that goes a long way, especially in such a saturated field and market that we're in. And I think that being authentic and being real with your audience is the number one thing that's going to get you where you want to be. Now, authentic authenticity is something you always told me to be. Right. Right. But you also told me to be consistent mm -hmm. and disciplined. Mm -hmm. And the most important part is don't worry about the comments. Right. That's the dark part of the space that I think is really not talked about by many. Absolutely. But part of the growth, part of the, the, the road to being an influencer are the haters, are the people that don't want you to succeed. And as you once told me, Dad, I may have 4.5 4 million followers, but they don't all like me. And that right. really resonated with me because mm -hmm. as a parent, seeing some of the comments were concerning. Mm -hmm. And we always checked in to see how you were dealing with it. And I want you to talk a little bit about that. Absolutely. I mean, I think it's easier said than done to just say, ignore the comments. And that's often what I tell myself. But I'd be lying if I said that every now and then there'll be a surfeit of comments that kind of get to me or will kind of make me feel terrible. Um, but I think that you have to adopt a mentality where you need to realize that the people who are commenting negativity about you are predominantly faceless people and people who aren't showing themselves off to the internet. So why would I be valuing someone's opinion who I can't see their face or I can't see what they're all about? Why should I value their opinion over someone who loves me or cares for me? And I think that adopting that kind of mentality is paramount to being able to block it out because it is true. I think a lot of people are scared by the possibility of receiving hate because it's almost certain that you're going to get hate. And and I think that's the big challenge that most people have, right? They they want to be everything to everyone and you just right. can't. You can't. Right? You can be Oprah Winfrey, you can be Ellen DeGeneres, you can be you can be I don't know, any celebrity that is a good role model, there are going to be people at the end of the day who don't like you and whether that's projection, whether that's jealousy, who knows, but people are going to hate you. Now, one of the things you did uh, quite early on was uh, an interview with Wealth Simple's Money Diaries. Mm -hmm. And they interviewed you, back, I think back in during COVID 2020, I believe. Yes. And one of the things they talked to you about was shelf life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we always thought about that this was just going to be a fad, but you've done something really interesting. You've reinvented yourself a few times and you've gone through this creative process and you take it quite seriously. How have you taken this influencer type role and extended the shelf life because you're now four years into it and i think you're getting stronger with the amount of opportunities you're getting you're you're changing the way you're presenting yourself and your content and you're looking at new avenues to create some revenue streams and opportunities what what's created that 
opportunity? Like, how have you gone through that process? Can you maybe shed some light on that? Um, I think that shelf life is a very important topic because at the end of the day, if you look at the top creators from 10 years ago, they are not parallel at all really with the top 10 influencers right now. Um, a lot of people have their rise and then their fall. And I think that for a lot of creators, they do see that rise and they get so accustomed and acclimated to those numbers. And then when they start to slip, they kind of throw in the towel and give up on it. Um, but I think that I wasn't done with my journey. And so I continued pushing and pushing and pushing until the next kind of uh, peak. And I guess I'm just going to continue that cycle because I truly love doing what I do. And I want to keep spreading the content that I do. So one of the things you've done, you started on TikTok mm -hmm. and then you started expanding to other channels. You've gone to Instagram, Twitter, X, and you did a bit of YouTube. Mm -hmm. How have you transformed and why did you transform from one channel to the other? Like that was kind of strategic in a way because of some events that happened. You want to talk through your, your thought process on that? I mean, I think that a lot of creators are just repurposing their content onto different platforms just to maximize its spread. But I mean, I use Twitter for, I don't know, I use that as a diary, if you will. I mean, I kind of just, whenever I feel something, I tweet. Um, but other platforms, I gave it a shot. But I feel that TikTok is most receptive to the type of content I make in the sense that it's low effort, admittedly. Um, and I think that TikTok and users on TikTok value that type of content. From a um, economic perspective, um, you got a good handle as to your age group, your uh, peer group. What are people in your peer group thinking about housing, rental units, the future, the prospects of being a homeowner? Because you, you're in university, you've gone through the process of getting uh, a place to rent each of your three years after you're done residency, you're in your fourth year now. What are some of the struggles people your age are going through and what outlook do they have on this whole housing situation? Um, I think the housing situation is very crazy. I think that for a lot of us, we've kind of just accepted that we'll never be homeowners and that's just something that our generations just might never have a grasp on unless generational wealth is in the question. Um, but I mean, just being a student, I think that a lot of people have found issues with rent as well, renting. Um, there have been a lot of bad landlord stories I've heard. I mean, I'm a little bit nervous about getting out of my lease in my apartment because our apartment came furnished and we learned the hard way that they furnish their apartments with really low quality Furniture that I found to be broken after I saw, I did the checkup noticing yeah. where they allowed me to say if anything was broken. So a lot of the things in our apartment are broken. So will we have to pay that crazy amount of money to fix Deposit. it? Probably. So, I mean, that's just one of the issues I faced. A lot of other people, you know, utilities are getting out of hand. Our utility bill was double last month, which makes no sense. It's... It's a disaster, everything. This morning, you looked at that little magnet on the fridge mm. and you pointed out, what the fudge? Houses, house prices were only double what people made yes. in my birth year, which in, was 1970, yes. right? And you were floored, angry, and pissed off. It bothered me because you can work two years and make enough money, revenue, to purchase a home. Whereas an entry level position for us is what, 60, 70, 80K, depending on your field. What's a house in Toronto cost? Over a million for sure. So that's times 15, 15. 20. So it's just really discouraging and unfair. But I feel like as long as I have a roof over my head, I'll be grateful. With respect to um, the impact you have beyond the laughter and the and the comedy skits like you've done uh, an unbelievable job making people laugh but you've also gone through um a change where you've lost a lot of weight mm -hmm. and i know you've helped a lot of people with hope in that regard what responsibility do you think you have to your follower group and 
and the millions of people that watch your content with the social aspect of it? I think that what I owe is being authentic and real. I think that if I am going to broadcast the weight loss that I went through, I think it's also important to broadcast the weight gain that I've gone through and the fact that I do struggle with yo-yoing with my weight. And I think that I kind of owe that to them because I think it's so easy to show the highlights of your life. But when you don't show your negatives, it almost creates a facade for your audience and creates an unrealistic expectation. And I think that that is what at least myself owes to my audience. What are some of the highlights of the last four years for you? I think some of the highlights have just been becoming a meme. I think that that's been something super cool. I think, you know. You just had your four year anniversary of that meme. Yes, I did have my four year anniversary of the astronomical video. And I think it's, it's pretty cool. I'm not gonna lie to, you know, have a viral audio, have a viral video. And that's something that is gonna stick with me for the rest of my life. And I, as much as it's a silly video, I think I'm really proud of it just cause, you know, it transcended national boundaries. It, you know, went around the world, celebrities were using it. It was just a crazy thing. And it slipped into people's vocabularies, even to the present. I've heard my professor say it, and it's just surreal how, I mean, not to take credit for it, but no one was really using that word before I did, so. Um, uh, also had a professor <laughs> at the University of Memphis write an academic paper yes, on it. So. <laughs> that was pretty cool because I do appreciate academia. So um, it was pretty cool seeing my quote being used in a political science context. So that was pretty cool. I just think the friends I've been able to make um, all around the world, being able to travel, see people, it's been truly a blessing. With respect to uh, some of the opportunities you've, you, you've gotten, um, you have been able to meet some wonderful people. Absolutely. And help you grow in other aspects of just social media, like business yes. opportunities. Um, are there any highlights there that you think, wow, I never thought this could happen? Oh, absolutely. Just, you know, having coffee chats with some other creators and people in the industry, I've just picked up on some little things that they do. And then maybe they pick up on some things that I do. And I just think that that, you know, that communication is really important in boosting all of us and elevating all of us and making sure that we all can maximize um, the economic benefits of what we do, because as much as it's fun, it's also super cool to be able to reap the economic benefits. And of collaborate. It too. Yes, absolutely. Your fourth year at Western mm -hmm. and Thank you've God. been lucky enough <laughs> to be able to do your thesis mm -hmm. on social media. Yes. Tell us a little bit about that and how much you're enjoying that. Yes, yeah, so I do study geography and my thesis is under the geography department, which some might think, how do those correlate? But um, I am doing my thesis on the TikTok algorithm and seeing what kind of yields a viral video and what my experience is with the TikTok algorithm. So I'm taking a qualitative and a quantitative approach to it. So I'm looking at numbers. I've collected data from 44 of my videos and seeing if there's any sort of relationship between likes, views, shares, and then a bunch of um, binary variables such as time of day posted, um, whether hashtags were used, et cetera. And then I'm also looking at the things that I can't measure, which would fall under the sentiment and qualitative analysis part of it. So it's been super cool. I've been finding some little things and I think it's honestly really helped in my content creation process. And I'm really, really grateful that I was able to do a thesis on this because otherwise I don't think I'd be enjoying it as much. <laughs> Will that thesis paper be available to people that may want to see it? Perhaps, maybe. maybe. Well, Mark, I really appreciate your time. I know you're busy and you came into town for another event, but thank you so much for of taking course. the time. I, I love this medium because the engagement's been unbelievable and helping people with education on the financial side mm -hmm. and the home ownership side has always been something I believed in. And I'm so glad you said, dad, stop doing TV. Nobody my age knows what a cable bill is. It's the future. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate it, dad. Thanks. Thanks.